Hello everyone and welcome to the Biodiversity Loss Session of the State of the World's Plants and Fungi Symposium. There's abundant evidence that uh, we are facing a, another mass extinction. Um, and the truth is that fundamental baseline data on fungal occurrences, distributions, and just their general biology uh, is almost completely lacking for most fungi. And I estimated that it would take um, 2,400 to 5,700 years to completely document fungi at our current pace. But people often refer to mycology as 100 years behind botany. But I would say that we're actually, um, that's an order of magnitude off. <laughs> we're probably more like a thousand years behind botany, uh, at least in this aspect. So what we did is um, we've been working on the systematics of this family. And primary species is this one, Boletus edulis. And this happens to be a morpho species complex that shows a very wide ecological amplitude. Uh, we do observe high inbreeding at local scales, which indicates limited long distance dispersal. Boulder woodlands have less genetic diversity. High nucleotide diversity at regional levels indicate episodic long distance dispersal. That's operating to maintain diversity over larger spatial scales. And despite strong continental structuring, we still observe ongoing inter intercontinental gene flow, which is maintaining species cohesion across the Northern Hemisphere. This means that to maintain the genetic diversity, which might help mitigate their extinction risk, they may require regular habitat turnover and habitat management at large spatial scales. These may not be aligned with the management priorities for the hosts. Um, and finally, precipitation and temperature appear to be driving the population and genetic structure in this species. You'll have been hearing about the extinctions of plants um, or have our activities as we have done them in the past already consigned us to lose more? This is an issue that we call extinction debt. In my case, the story begins with something known as the species area relationship. And so as you can see, overall, bigger islands have more species. The bigger the area, the more biodiversity it can support. But the converse is also true. The smaller the area, the less biodiversity it can support. And that means if we start off with a forest or something or an island, and for some reason that loses area, ultimately we have to lose species as well. And if you apply it to something like the Amazon forest, the Amazon rainforest, all the species in the Amazon rainforest, you get figures on the order of 3000 species or something a year. That's not plants, that's everything. Now suppose uh, you have a catastrophe that wipes out four fifths of the habitat. And so you're left with a community with just uh, you know, less than 20% of the original individuals. You can see that we haven't lost all the species or we haven't lost uh, four fifths of the species. We've only lost one fifth of the species. The black went extinct immediately, but all the rest are still hanging on. The, the yellow and the green are still hanging on. And so that might seem okay. The problem is, that as time goes by, the yellow was cut down to one organism and the green to two. Well, if I was talking to mammal biologists or I was talking about mammals, then I could easily say, well, the yellow is bound to go extinct because you have to have at least a pair. But in the world of plants and fungi, things are not so simple as that. Nevertheless, the rule will still apply that small populations become more vulnerable to extinction. Being lost. And so we're stuck with a community with this number of species. And so these ones are likely to go extinct, but not immediately. So that delay is what extinction debt is. We did a, a sort of a meta-analysis of the various studies of uh, extinction debt or delayed extinction in, in, in plant populations. And we found that uh, the, the half-life could range from 16 years or so to um, 450 years, just in the three studies we looked at. 
But anybody who wants to create a model uh, of extinction debt and make predictions about extinction debt size and uh, the half-life will have a will have to do a lot of work because, as Professor Bryn showed. Uh, Fungi, I haven't said anything about fungi because our knowledge about fungi in this area is, is essentially very, very small indeed. And our knowledge for plants is still limited. Many things we still have to take into account, seed banks, self-fertilization, and the extreme values of some plant traits, which means that recently protected areas may continue to lose extinct uh, species like Barra Colorado Island. Um, and just because things look good or okay now doesn't mean that they will continue. We've got to look at the dynamic side of this. Yeah, I'll be I'll segue to uh, Professor Haley's talk, and I'll give you a bit more detail into what is happening during this extinction debt. So, if we think about the the subtitle of this of this session, we're asking what is driving extinction rates, and we can of course think of the five major anthropogenic threats that we have ex species that have not yet gone extinct, but might be in the, are, are likely going to be in the near future. And this brings us to the question, okay, what might we be able to do to save them, right? So this, if we want to interfere with this, with this um, process, we might as well know what is actually happening. So as I mentioned, uh, in order to start understanding this, uh, my supervisors and I, we conducted a review of the uh, recent literature yeah. and we see that plants basically dominate the occurrences and we'll explore a bit more as to why this happens. What happens at one level scales up and feeds back down and this is what creates this delayed extinction, this delayed response of communities that um, Professor Haley started presenting. So if we look at, when we looked at the studies reporting extinction depths, that's uh, most often they attribute the occurrence of a death to species um, traits that, and finally we have the, the least um, address is the one referring to the, the, the role of uh, extinction cascades. So we know that when we think of communities, we, we, it, it has been reported that insects go extinct before plants. In fact. So in the end, we are, we're dealing with two interacting extinction processes, which we are yet to explore what this means in terms of uh, how long does it take, how faster does each of these processes make each other. Okay, we, these are the ones we, we might need to address but always keeping in mind this hierarchical relationship, meaning that whatever happens at the individual, at the local population, meta population, and at the community level interacts and affects the whole response. And because of that, we have proposed the use of uh, mechanistic eco-evolutionary models to simulate different scenarios and try to verify the different roles of different processes. So these are whole models simulating whole communities, which a variety of um, ecological processes that we can play around, uh, let's say, and see what we understand of these processes and uh, hopefully inform uh, conservation well, measures. Take home messages. I hope I was able to convey you the idea that extinctions are quite complex processes that are interacting and that they take time. So in no way the idea of an extinction that that should be taken as okay we have some time to act we can risk this disturbance because we have some time before the the community responds no it's not like that it's not that guaranteed we still don't know how fast they happen Creating that the more we disturb environments and our best chance is that the our best chance is to decrease those deaths by some form of uh, restoration. Um, focusing on using machine learning and statistical modeling to try and guide our assessment processes. If we want to know what's driving extinction um, rates, we first need to identify what's going extinct and what's at risk of going extinct. Um, but also, if we want to conserve species, um, we really have limited resources to do that. So I think it's really important that we 
identify which species are at risk so that we can allocate our resources uh, in a good way. However, currently we only have around 10% of all plant species with a global red list assessment. Um, but it's not just the IUCN red list that uh, forms extinction risk assessments. Uh, there are lots of other ways of doing it. So countries often have their own red listing uh, efforts, and these can take time to be incorporated into the IUCN red list, or other, there are other sort of systems for categorizing the extinction risk of species. And that's what we did again in 2020 for our uh, report for the state of the world plant and fungi. Um, we reanalyzed this data to see how much progress had been made since the original analysis. And there were lots of steps to this, as you can see in this bar chart, but the key takeaway message is that there's been a 23.1 increase in global assessments of plants since that original analysis. Um, and part of this will be due to BGCI's efforts to incorporate lots of new um, sources of information. But a large amount of those uh, new assessments are from an increase of around 19,000 IUCN red list assessments. There are sort of gaps and biases in how these species have been assessed, how they've been chosen to be assessed. Um, and we can see one aspect of that if you look at these two maps. So on the left, um, there's a map of species richness in botanical countries that I've put together using data from the World Checklist of Vascular Plants. And then on the right, um, I've just plotted uh, on another map the proportion of species in each of those botanical countries that have a global extinction risk assessment on the IUCN red list. Um, but another way of looking at this is looking at how representative assessed species on the IUCN red list are of all vascular plant diversity. 56% of vascular plants are endemic to a single botanic country, whereas on the red list, around 49% of those assessed species are endemic to a single botanic country. So we see we've got a slight underrepresentation of endemic species on the red list. We've got the opposite problem. We've got an overrepresentation of useful species on the red list. Um, the red list is a bit more representative, but you can still see an overrepresentation of species from Africa and a slight underrepresentation of species from South America and tropical and temperate Asia. So this really leads us to two questions that we're trying to solve. The first is how can we use this unrepresentative sample to set our uh, extinction risk assessment priorities? And the second is how can we start to fill in the gaps in this uh, picture? This gives us an overall estimate of 39% of uh, vascular plants being threatened, which is lower than uh, if you just took the raw values from the IUCN red list. Um, but interestingly, it's a fair bit higher than a, previ a previous estimate um, using a different method from 2016. But one thing that we should note is that you can see the uncertainty on the estimates is quite high. Um, so while we can be fairly confident, I think in our overall estimate, we need to work on our model and improve it um, and choose maybe different attributes to try and bring down that uncertainty so that it's more useful for guiding our assessment process. And on the right here, you can see two recent examples. So the first is um, a paper last year from Stevart et al, who used uh, one of these thresholding methods to get preliminary assessments for the tropical African flora. And at the bottom is a, an app that uh, I helped develop uh, when I was in the conservation assessment and analysis team called Rapid Least Concern, which is meant to generate um, red list assessments for species that you can be fairly certain are gonna come out as least concern in the assessment process. And then the second way, perhaps the more intelligent way to do it, um, is to learn these thresholds from data about previous assessments and use machine learning to generate predictions uh, for unassessed species. So here we've done that for our models and we can see that range and human population density are the most influential and that's really what we would expect. Or uh, some newer methods such as this called SHAP uh, gives you individual explanations for each prediction and here we can see that our EOO, our very small EOO, is pushing our prediction to higher values of threat whereas a very small human population density is counteracting that and pushing it back down 
to lower um, values of threat. So for this prediction, that low human population density is pushing our prediction to a not threatened value, uh, which really line, the good thing about this is it lines up with the justification for the assessment of the species. The, um, um, coming from a sort of a plant perspective, um, you know, a for, when we think about a forest, we think first of the plants that make up that habitat, but you know, the other organisms that are involved like fungi and many others may um, respond differently. And, and as I said, you know, it may be that having some sort of um, interference with a um, intact, as it's called, intact habitat is actually required for maintaining proper genetic diversity of some of these other organisms. So I haven't worked with reintroductions yet not mm -hmm. modeling or anything, but this is one of the I, one of the things that we want to address. We want to see, okay, what happens when we reintroduce introduce certain, certain um, species, but we always need to go back to that question where extinction deaths, they are response of the community. So we, we must know how that community, what are the dynamics of that community, what reintroducing a species might mean for that case. And then again, in, that, in some cases, models might help illuminate, but also data is important to check, uh, check how that community is behaving the past few years and what will mean uh, a reintroduction mean. So again, it's a question of case by case analysis, I would say. Thank you. Lydia. Yeah, I think uh, I, I think that uh, you could look at it in terms of what kind of a community it is. As, as Ludmin says, you need to look at it a case by case basis. Now, if the community has recently suffered a loss of area, if the habitat or park or something has recently suffered a loss of area, it's likely that there would be, it would be in a super saturated state. There'd be too many species, so to speak, for that to support. On the contrary, there's a, there's a phenomenon called colonization credit. So mm -hmm. it's when area becomes free for some reason or another. Um, and uh, there, there's, there are fewer species present than are um, that might, you might expect. So that would be the time to think about um, introducing species. So it, it would be in that framework, I would say. Thank you. And now to machine learning. And the question is, are you just using geographical distribution data or do you use parameters related to population reduction? And if so, how do you do it? Um, yeah, so for our predictions, uh, we've mainly, almost entirely been using predictors based off of uh, geographic predictors. So the most available data for plants um, is just point occurrences from where the specimens have been collected. Um, but it would be really great to try and incorporate some information about uh, population reduction or population size. It's just, it's not, that widely available. Um, so one thing that could possibly be done is I think what um, Steve Backman, who I used to work in the same team as, is looking at now, which is looking at the reduction in available habitat for species. Um, but that takes a lot more calculation um, effort to do. So currently it's just, for us, it's just geographic predictors, um, but it would be really good to try and incorporate other types of evidence into these models as well. Miller, Barnaby, John, and Tabrin for participating, for your great and stimulating talks, and for answering the questions.